I am wrestling, you're not weak for me. Celebrate what I am. Celebrate what I have been. Celebrate what I represent. And celebrate the many ways I have impacted your life. I will survive this test as I have survived others. I am forever etched into the very fiber of all mankind. The world needs me. Time is on my side. History guarantees me. I am wrestling. Do not wait for me. What's up, everybody? This is Ben Askren. Welcome to episode 30 of the T-Row and Funky Show. I'm joined, as always, by my man, Tommy Rowlands, who is in, not Ohio, but he's in Iowa today. What's going on, Tommy? You're on the road? What's up, my brother? Yes, I am away on business. I'm in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The company I work for just set up a facility here, so I'm spending a couple days out here. So I'm podcasting away in Cedar Rapids, God's country. You know, you could you could argue it's the capital of wrestling in America, this state. So, well, you know. we we you know what when we have, we have a an old timer Jerry Briscoe on a little later, and I bet he's going to take us all the way back to a man named Frank Gotch, and boom, uh, the yep. German bone on bone. You know, all the way from Iowa. Where is he from? Humboldt, I believe. Humboldt, Iowa. There you go. So you are in the motherland. Now, did you stop by uh, Cedar Falls and see your old nemesis, Tommy? Uh, Oh my God, Tolly Thompson! Did you see him today by any chance? No, I didn't. I was, I flew in, landed in Cedar Rapids, drove to Des Moines and back, and now I'm back in Cedar Rapids and looking forward to a nice rest and talking some wrestling. Boom! Well, you know that Tolly's that that's a big old guy out there in Cedar. He's Falls. a big boy, good guy, man, good guy. And you lost him in the 2004 Trials Finals when you were no. a young guy. No, I Five. lost to him. When I was 19 in the 2001 mini tournament, uh, I got right. smacked around. And then I beat him in the finals of the mini tournament in 2002. Mm. And okay. then That's what it was. I, I don't believe we've wrestled since. Okay. Okay. Like, Fair enough. Yeah. So, I listen, I follow you on Facebook. I saw your updates. You were listening to some country music. So, do you just want me to go off on the World Cup? <laughs> I still followed all the results. Okay. Why don't why, why can't we talk about the CMA Fest? Well, I mean, I you know I, I would venture to guess some of our interest listeners are interested in country music, but uh, I sure give a, give a little plug. What do you got from the CMA Fest? Uh, I highly recommend attending the CMA Fest. I've, it's my third year in a row doing it. It's three nights in a row. Well, four nights in a row. We only stay for three. If you like country music, there is not a better time you could have. Wow. And, uh, I'll just leave it at that. And then, Great you know time. There's two country music festivals here in Wisconsin. There was a Country Thunder, I believe, was just in Eau Claire last week. And I know a good friend coach at Eastern Michigan, Luke Smith, was attending that. And then a couple of my wrestlers are missing practice week because they're going to, I believe it's called Country USA. And then right. Oshkosh. Well, you know, I'm not particularly fond of country music. I don't hate it, but I would definitely would not attend uh, – well, the red the red nakedness the of uh, the red nakedness of the festival would just bug me out a little bit. Well, let me tell you, there's there's zero red nakedness uh, at this. Yeah, festival. right. You are crazy. Okay, if country music. There's some red nakedness. Uh, if if you um, are a single male, there is not a better place to be than Nashville, Tennessee, the weekend of the CMA Fest. Let's wow. just say that. Well, and I was with my wife. And uh, <laughs> even she was saying the same thing. So um, it's not hardly rednecked-ness. <laughs> well, I, you know, redneck women, they like to get down too. And they need to <laughs> so, you know, I'll send a note to my, my self, former single self 10 years ago to attend That's that. That's right. I think I'm 12 years back. So, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go. World Cup. Tommy, I actually had a down weekend. I didn't have much going on. So I watched... Ooh, I want to say a good six, six, maybe up to eight hours of World Cup action. Um, fun, man. I haven't got to watch that much super high level wrestling in a long time. And obviously, so first and foremost, thank you to Flo. Um, I remember, you know, when I watched, when I, I'm sorry, when I competed, and I'm sure you competed in a few of them, the World Cup in 2008 uh, in Vladi Kavkaz, there wasn't a damn camera in the building. No one, right. knew, no one knew the results. I mean, and then my brother competed in Tehran in 2013. And, and same thing. I, I couldn't watch any of his matches. I could barely find the damn result of who he wrestled and what the score was. 
Um, and so now to be sit, be able to sit on my couch and watch literally all of the matches, man, times are changing, huh? No doubt. I think, you know, the best way to put it is that there was never a demand to watch the World Cup because it never was part of – people never knew how great it was. And Flow Wrestling is like creating demand out of nothing. And um, I think people now want to watch the World Cup. I mean, it's cool. It's a team atmosphere. You know, the the dual uh, format is easier to follow as a casual fan. It's easier to be a patriotic fan when you're watching it that way. And I thought, you know, and to your point, I was at the country concert, but I followed all the results and I felt the enthusiasm from the American wrestling community on social media all weekend. I followed all the results religiously and – um but it sounds like it was a tremendous success on flow. Yeah, I mean, it, it sure appeared that way. You know what? One of the things that I have to commend, and this is one of the things we talked about in the Professional Wrestling League, is that the production value was good. I mean, it was uh, good announcing. The venue looked good. It looked pretty full. The fans seemed to be into it. You know, there was the Iranian fans, obviously. Um, there was a good contingent of USA fans. And so, uh, man, it was just a great environment for wrestling. There was a lot of really good matches. Uh you know, I don't, I don't know which ones you cared about, but obviously the Iran the Iran USA match to go to the finals was uh, it was a really good match. Uh, you know what? And overall, Team USA. I know we're on our home turf, but we looked really good because we were competing without Jordan Burroughs. without Delagnev, without Delagnev. So uh, you know, we were down a few, and obviously Russia didn't bring their first team, and I, I, you know, Iran was up without Yazdani at ninety seven kilo. But I thought Jaden. Did very well for himself. He went three and one. Frank the Tank. Yeah, Tommy, I'm, may, maybe I might be unpatriotic, but I don't love Frank's wrestling style. But he did a good job. He had great results. Uh, I find his style to be fairly boring. Um, and then James Green. What a difference a weight class makes. I mean, unbelievable, isn't uh, it? It's, it's crazy. You know, just what what that weight cut took out of him because he. I mean, he looked like dog crap at the trials at 143, and then you put him back up at yeah. 154, and he's a freaking animal. Four and zero, wrestler of the week. What did he beat? Like three guys in the top ten at that weight. Yeah, and uh, not that he was any worse because he was a bronze medalist from last year, but yeah, just very, very impressive results. Across the board, Team USA wise, you had Kyle Snyder going four and zero. Then did Jay you did you watch his matches? Because he had a couple. Yeah, I where... watched. I watched all of his. I watched some of Jaden's. Okay. Um, I watched one of Molinero's. Um, I watched uh, Dennis's match against the Georgian. Dennis might be outgunned a little bit. I you know I, I know a lot of people like him, and a lot a lot of my wrestlers in particular at, at AWA were commenting on how much they loved the Wild Man documentary that just came out on, on Flow. But uh, and they were you know a lot of people were high on him, but he kind of looks to be outgunned. I mean, how how do you feel? Yeah, you know I mean, way? yeah, I mean, I I do feel that way. I'm not really like it's not like I didn't feel that way when he made the team, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just don't feel like he's at the level that Snyder is, or that Burroughs is, or that Det Lagnev is. And candidly, I didn't think. Um, Jaden was at that level until approximately, oh, I don't know. I, I started to believe in the middle of his qualifying event, like, wow, I mean, holy smokes. And so, you know, those four guys are, to me, a step above the rest of our team. Well, Molinaro, like I said, listen, I don't love his style, but the guy was winning matches. No, I yeah, I'm just they, saying that I, he's doing well, too. Our, our team is wrestling well. I mean... I think we've got four guys that are top five in the world. That's two thirds of our Olympic team. Four guys are uh, so I'm I'm assuming you're you're saying Delagnev, Snyder, Cox, and Burroughs. Correct. Four out of the six. Yeah, that's two thirds of the Olympic team. I think is legitimately top five. I mean, I mean, what, you know, where does Molinaro sit right now? Because, like I said, uh, he you know it it wasn't pretty, but he won the matches. Um, he, you know, he got it done and. Uh, he wasn't great in the qualifier, but it, it almost looks to me as if he every match he's gaining a little more confidence in, in his style. Yeah, no, I think he's just outside the top five looking in, you know, maybe 9, 10, 11, something like that. But, you know, candidly, uh, Ben, I don't know enough about the global landscape to really make a comment on his ranking. I'm just talking about when you watch him wrestle, the feeling you get. Sure. Against yeah. you know it, it's it's it doesn't it, it, it sounds like I'm like poo pooing and I'm not. No, I got I got I, I got to say 
I think watching those other four, I feel like they are going to be wrestling for medals. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I just know, feel that Delagnev, way. Delagnev does make me nervous because well, there's a question mark he there. misses a lot of stuff yeah. due to injury. So um, Varner didn't look bit bad at heavyweight either. You think he's considering going up? I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Is he going to continue wrestling? Have we decided that? I thought I, we said he oh. might be done. Yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, he's he's out there wrestling in the World Cup, but wait up. I mean, if you if you were going to be retired, it doesn't sound like exactly the most fun weekend in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I were him, he's 230. He can go with those guys. I would, if I were him, I'd consider moving up. If you know, if I wanted to continue. Uh, well, he, you know, the weight the weight's not an issue. It's just the leverage and height in relation to his size. You know, yeah, because cause... I weighed 230 and wrestled heavyweight as well, but I was six four. And obviously, Varner's a darn good wrestler, so I'm not even saying. I'm just and saying. He's strong, too. Yeah, I'm just saying, physics wise, you know, those are the things that are tough to overcome. It's like either you have to have leverage or speed or yeah. power over, you know, the top eight or nine in the world. And does he have any one of those things at heavyweight? You know what I mean? Yeah. Is probably yeah, the yeah. considerations that he needs to make. Got you. But, all, you know, also, if. I mean, the other consideration, despite the worldwide, is. Uh, if Snyder continues to get better, how, he's never going to make another team at 213, ever. Yeah, and I, right? I can see Varner and making the team at heavyweight. That's what I'm saying. Delagnes retiring. Gwiz hasn't hit his prime yet. Gwiz, um, Gwiz, Ray, and Varner, I would take one of those three. Yeah, and I mean, and Ray's starting to get a little older also. So, um, you know, I, I – How old I, is Ray? What is Ray, like 28, 29? I'd say 28, 29. I'd say Varner's well, – Varner's probably 28, 29, 30, somewhere in there. Oh, Varner. Yeah, I would say 30. 30. Yeah. He's the same age as my brother. So, yeah. So, I mean, if I was if I was Varner and I wanted to continue competing, Snyder's only going to get better. I would just say, F it. I'm bumping up the heavyweight. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, the heavyweights can't really wrestle that well anyways. Yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course. Uh, dagger. <laughs> hey, you know what? I was, I was, well, you know, I knew this. I knew it, Tommy. But sometimes, like, when it's just in your face, you kind of, like, forget how, how drastic it is. But those Iranians don't do anything but push. They push and they push and they push and they're freaking good at pushing, but man, they don't leg attack very much. No, the only th I agree. I agree. I will give the Iranians credit though. I think that they're in shape. Yeah, they're in shape and they push, but, but <laughs> they need a little. I mean, saying, uh, most, people, most people think the European style is like, oh, they're a bunch of dogs. They never train, and it's like the more I watch, it's like. The Russians are in pretty good shape. The Iranians are in good shape. The Cubans are in good shape. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, they know they're in shape, but yeah, they, they don't hit their knees very much. Rahimi obviously attacks quite a bit. But once you got past him, even uh, I have trouble with him. Well, I'll tell you who does Ishmael attack. Ishmael Poor or whatever against Ramos wasn't hitting his knees. He was Did just getting watch. that freaking underhook and driving. He, he pushed Ramos around like Ramos is a child. I mean, he's... Out of bounds, out of bounds, out of I'll bounds. I'll tell you who pushes, but he also shoots is Yazdani. The Yazdani, the 97? 97. Yeah, that or, dude's taking shots. Well, did you see the, the new, I think his name, full name is Yazdani Chiridi. The, the, he's a 74 kilo. He won he won silver medal at, at 70 kilo last year. Right. Oh, yeah, I like that guy. He smashed Deeringer. I mean, I, I like, listen, Deeringer from Wisconsin. i never seen Deeringer get beat up like that, ever, ever. No, I would say that. That's on that guy's on Jordan Burroughs radar. I you know what? I was just talking to someone about this the other day. I think the way that he wrestles, I don't think he's got the style to beat Burroughs. Um he's, well, he's got of, a lot of leg to grab. Exactly. <laughs> you know what he kind of wrestles you know what a, I mean? a little wide open style. And if you give yeah. Burroughs space, there's no one better in the world with space than Burroughs. No. Um so you know, well, the he only can't guy, lose. He can't lose if you give him space. No, he can't lose. The only guy, you know, the only kind of wrestler that can uh, – and really it's the two people that have beat him are, are guys that have been able to, to, to close the distance and slow him down. That's well, Godoyev, Mar Maribel – well, Godoyev didn't beat him, yeah. but he, he took him to the brink. Yep. Maribel and, uh, and Sargush. what's his head? Sargush, Sargush, yeah. So all those guys close space. They kept the match close. You're not going to wrestle wide open styles and, and beat Burroughs. You're not going to gas him out. You're not going to um, uh, you know out outgun him. So – uh, you know, that guy's pretty amazing. He's a young kid, but I just I don't think he's got the style to be. Well, right. I think you're right. I think you're right in the sense that his style just does not match well with Burroughs. But I think at this point, I mean, 
I kind of think, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm willing to say that he's the number one contender on on paper. And from like, I think he's going to be the guy. Yeah. And you Either know, the semis or the fine, you know, he's going to be he's going to either get third or silver. You know, he's going to get a bronze or silver, depending on where he's at with Burroughs. And, and Russia still hasn't determined who they're going to send. Hold on. We got Jerry Briscoe. I'm going to add him in here. This is your producer, Jake. It looks like when Ben answered the call, the recording stopped, but he did resume it, and we only missed the very first part of the interview. So we do jump back in with Briscoe talking about today's top wrestling talent. When's gonna or Cox is going to be a stud in the in the in the Olympics? I think he's going to be a real big factor there. No doubt. The guy, the guy. Every time I see him, he comes on. He gets better and better. He's so quick and he's so powerful at that weight class. I think it's a perfect weight class for him. Yeah, definitely. So, hey um, Ben, not to and interrupt. Of course, and of course, Snyder. I mean, what can you say about that kid? Well, you He's know, I'll tell dad. you a story, Jerry, real quick. Uh, my co-host here, Tommy. Oh, God. I, on the very first episode, Tommy made the mistake of talking about the ass whipping Kyle Snyder gave him <laughs> in the Ohio State wrestling room. And I have brought it up almost every single episode since then. <laughs> it was well, bad, Jerry. That. I mean, you know, it was bad. I was, it was, I think it was November of last year. He was like two months out of off the world title and. I had just got done running a marathon, so I was by no means in shape, but you know, I was in okay shape. We're running a marathon, and you're not in shape? <laughs> yeah, well, you know the shape you got to be in for yeah, wrestling, exactly. so it wasn't really you're at that. Shape, you know, yeah. I'm, th- I'm 34. I was 34 at the time. I'm 35 now, and uh-huh. um, I always told him, if you ever want to work out, I'd be willing to, and I meant like drilling, you know, and uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> met him, I met him to drill, and he's like, hey, you want to go <laughs> match? And I just, I think, I guess I'm innately trained to never – back down from a challenge you said go right you I, said, go. Let's, I said let's go man and man we went or he went he went oh, wow. he, he went took, he, he took went. me with him he took me with him so yeah, yeah that, that had to be an experience though i mean that, that kid to me i mean what is it 21 years old barely and and he's got a future ahead of him you know yeah honestly it was probably the first time i ever got you know i ever felt truly felt old you know what i mean i was like Oh, yeah. Man, there there is another level out there, and I'm not there anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, uh, not that I was, not that I was ever a champ, but you know what I mean. I was competing with those yeah. guys. I, I like you know when you going to these tournaments and talking to coaches. They they, they say you know Briscoe, how, how, how you stand up and pop those hips out. And I said, man, I can't remember. And as far as popping those hips out, <laughs> the only pop I hear is when I get up in the morning. <laughs> they pop <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> uh. uh. All right, so hey, Jerry, we're going to get into what what we brought you on here for, and that's you're an expert in the field. So Tommy and I last week we hit on, you know, bringing a professional wrestling avenue to to wrestling, and you know I think it's important to go back and understand the history of where we came from and, and to to understand where we're at right now. And I don't, you know, I know you, and I know we've had these conversations, and I don't think there's really anyone better. Who can give us the backstory from you know from the days of way back when when you know wrestling was barnstorming the guys went around town and, and you know put money up to whip whip each other's ass and then you know eventually they diverged one of them went to professional wrestling and the other one went to you know folk style collegiate wrestling and they've kind of been diverging ever since. Right. Well, uh, Ben, you know all, all this all this happened you know back back in the twenties. Uh, with uh, Gotch and, and Hackensmith, uh, two great uh, uh, Greco wrestlers, and uh, uh, for uh, Hackensmith, of course, a, a German, and uh, Gotch, an, an Iowa, and they just put statues up of, of, of him in, in Iowa this past year. But they they had probably the last legitimate series of of wrestling, and then after that, it's it started. Uh, we're, we're moving into the uh, 1900s, uh, early 1900s at that time, man. And th- that's that's where wrestling really started becoming sports entertainment because these guys were making these big trips around the countries and, and you weren't getting to uh, perform many nights. And, you know, the nights you would, they'd be, you know, I mean, I've read accounts, uh, some of these books, Mike Chapman, uh, uh, you know, the great historian uh, uh, writes, uh, these guys, you know, back in the uh, 19, early 1900s, having having crowds of, of 
gross money wise close to a hundred thousand dollars. So yeah, well, but well, they right, didn't have don't get me wrong. Gotch versus Hackenschmidt was at Comiskey Park what night nineteen ten, and they drew. I want to say 40,000 people. 40,000 40, 40, people. 39, almost 40,000 people. That's, that's right. And like I said, those were probably the last legit matches. And then, and after that, you know, guys started realizing, hey, we can make some money and we got to do it nightly. So, uh, so, you know, of course, promoters pop up at that time. Maybe they're seeing all this money made, you know, only 40,000 people come in and stuff like that. So, Promoters start popping up, and then when the promoters start popping up, they started divvying up the country. And and, and and let's face it, the Midwest was really where all the wrestling was at the time because of the immigrants coming in. And uh, you had the Polish people out there, and, you know, the Italian people and everybody, you know. So they brought the, the traditions of, of the catch wrestling with them. And the several forms of wrestling popped up at that time. The catch is catch can wrestling, the, 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 the traditional folk style. And then, you know, the entertainment. Uh, these guys started making living. A lot of these amateur wrestlers that, you know, during, during, during the off season, they would wrestle the carnivals. Yeah. And they'd go country, uh, uh, city to city wrestling in, in, in the carnies. And that's really how pro wrestling started to develop was out of the carnival acts and, and things like that. So let, let, me, let wow. me ask you a question here because one of the things that I know I heard on the, on this topic because this is a topic that fascinates me is that uh, you know at some point the, the matches were legitimate right and then and then they came to um, have a predetermined outcome if you will and in, in my understanding in those first predetermined outcomes the, the contestants wrestled a real legitimate match backstage to determine who the winner would be, and then they went out and they kind of played it up a little more, you know, a little more exciting for the fans. But the winner had been for determined the backstage, right? That, that's that's exactly right, and, and and that tradition continued, uh, you know, well into the uh, to the to the nineteen twenties, and but. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys, they were legitimate wrestlers, and, and they just did the show business to make money. But uh, a lot of them were, were coming out of college. A lot of them were coming out of, out of war at the time. And they a lot of them were studs and uh, uh, bodybuilders, weightlifters. And, but like I said, a lot of college wrestlers would come out, and they'd join the carnival acts. And, and, and they would have, when it became uh, entertainment, uh they would have, you know, marks in the audience, you know, come up and challenge this kid, you know, hey, we got this this young ah, kid here. Yeah, and then yeah. the marks would come up and they'd challenge the kid and go five or ten. Then, you know, all the toughs, hey, well, that, you know, that little skinny kid over there went ten minutes with this guy. <laughs> I could beat him. So he'd jump in the ring, put his 25, 50 bucks down, and, of course, the guy would turn it up and do the hook style, you know, put one uh -huh. of those hooking moves on uh -huh. you and, uh, and literally break your arm if you didn't submit right away. That, that was probably the beginning of MMA at that time there. Yeah, and the that. carnival went around and they couldn't stay in one place uh, too many times because uh, they would, you know, their identity would be, be exposed. And yeah. so a lot of these college guys, that's the reason they just moved around from carnival to carnival also. So then at, at what point does it become more... Um you know, more of like a, a promotion or an organization, you know, like I know one that's on ESPN Classic all the time is the AWA, which I believe maybe Vern Gagne, who was a real legitimate wrestler in the University of Minnesota, had some part in, in organizing or managing. Um, so well, when did those leagues start popping up? Is that the 50s, the 60s? Where, where are we at there? Well, okay, uh, the AWA, uh, back, okay, when they were, like, like I said, after Hackensmith and Gotch had their little series, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the promoters started coming in. There was three promoters, uh, I can't recall their names, but one of them, Cooch Mott, is, is the original promoter. He, he went on to be, what, what become year, what, what years are we in right we're, now? We're Jerry? talking, we're talking probably 1920s, okay. 1920s okay. to 30s, that era there, which they actually call it one of the golden eras of, of professional wrestling because it, it got so huge. But this is when the concept of a, of a territory, you know, like wrestling back in the old days had these little territories yeah. where like the NWA, AWA and WWWF at the time, they all had their little local, the markets. So 
these three promoters got together and 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 kind of uh, monopolized the Midwest, and they shared talent with each other, but they wouldn't share them with anybody else. Uh, and yeah. so, uh, so, uh, but their champion uh, was Hackensmith. He got hurt and he had to retire. So uh, they, you know, wrestling started going on the down on downhill. So these little uh, puppet organizations started springing up all around. One night, uh, Ben, guys, they had they had eight world championship matches. So this guy, Hickey George in, in Waterloo, Iowa, of all places, decided he was going to form a, a, a union and get a bunch of promoters together. So he got the original NWA guys together uh, and, okay. and said, okay, guys, you know, we're going to we're gonna control the talent here in this organization. We're going to have one champion because at that time you have eight championship matches in one night. That's when the public really started, hey, man, you know, this thing, this wrestling is, you know, not for real. It is scripted. Well, so they I united, thought that had one until champion. like 87, they one Jerry. Champion. Pardon? I thought I thought that the people didn't realize it wasn't wasn't scripted till eighty seven when Vince McMahon had to go on trial. <laughs> eighty three, yeah, eighty three yeah. with well, the athletic commission. I mean, oh, right? well, and, and okay, this is, yeah, I'll take you back even before though. Uh, uh, was nineteen uh, twenty nine or thirty a uh, promoter uh, by the name of. Uh, uh, why the hell I can't even remember his name, but his New York guy. He got with the New York Times, and he he uh, they wrote uh, he wrote an expose on professional wrestling. You know how it was predetermined backstage, just like you said, Ben. And of yeah. course, that the New York Times published it, and then it caught on all around the United States. And so you know, wrestling kind of took it because after Hackett Smith was he was such an international, so they had nobody ready to take his place there. And so. Uh, so it kind of died, and these promoters got together, and they started building their own little champions and trading, trading talent and starving out the other little promotion uh, uh, business. So uh, they ended up the only ones. But then their champion gets hurt, and like I said, kind of all goes to hell. So Pinky George got, got together and I with like 10, 12 promoters and developed the NWA, which Vern Gagne was one of them. Well, Byrne didn't agree with who was going to be the champion. And all these guys decided who was going to be the, the world champion at the time, and they wanted Lou Fez, you know, one of the, one of the yeah. all-time greats in, in the pro ranks. And Byrne, coming from the college ranks, you know, hey, I'm the time national champion. You know, I should, I should be the, the champion. So they didn't go with Byrne. They went with, uh, went, went, went with Lou. And so uh, that's when uh, Byrne broke away from the NWA and went, but went back home to Minnesota, got some backers, and started the AWA up. But everything started changing at that time, man, because the NWA started getting weaker. And I tell you guys, what what broke everybody's back was when cable television came in. Yeah. So at that at, at the time when when there were little territories, all the promoters had agreement. Hey, your TV won't come into my area. My yeah, TV yeah. won't come into your area. So you're you're protected by that unwritten code well it was a written uh, code but you were protected by the by the nwa uh uh rule book so uh you know there wasn't any contest so when but when cable came in the promoters couldn't control or you know where ted turner wanted to put a super station so yeah. all of a sudden here comes cable tv blasting in and you see anything for the first time i don't care what it is you know it's harassing or what but here's a new group of guys. You know, you're going to watch the new group to see what they have to offer, just just to see them. You know, yep. and the group, you know, all of a sudden, man, they're on national TV, and and and, and the business starts booming. That uh, Jordan Championship Wrestling for like five years was the number one cable show, number one show on cable TV in, in the United States. It was huge. It was seen everywhere. Jeez. And that's when business started changing, you know, uh, it, because of the, the local territory. So it was, it was an opportunity and a threat all at the same time. It was an opportunity for talent, but a real threat for promotions. And that's when promotions started dying because they couldn't keep up with talent. Talent was, as always, is, is an issue, you know, <laughs> where sure. you're going to get your next superstar. So, you know, so everybody of course all the talent all the really top talent wanted to go to georgia because of the superstition because you're seeing you're seeing everywhere in the united states every little town that has cable has a cable system this is the very beginning of cable not all cities had cable at the time so 
when a, when a city would open up like, say, Cleveland, we would get together, and I was fortunate enough to own part of Georgia Championship Wrestling when, when we busted open like that. So when 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 Cleveland would open up cable, all right, this cable system, they're going to carry 200,000 homes. So we'd figure out where the meat of that of that uh, 200,000 people is, and we'd, then we'd go into Cleveland and rent a building right smack dab in the middle of that, that footprint of that 200,000 people and sell it sell out the arena. So ah. we really got into the science of chasing the ratings around the country at that time, and it was it was as successful as heck. Nice. Uh, so, okay, so that, I mean, that was an outstanding history lesson, much better than I could have ever given. <laughs> so now we understand where... We understand what pro wrestling is today because we all see it on television, and it, you know it, you can't miss it, right? And I yeah, was it's making, everywhere. Everywhere. I was making the point to Tommy that the the WrestleMania, well, this year probably made more money in one weekend than amateur wrestling has made in the last fifty years, all events combined, <laughs> right? So I, I would say you're right on the money there. Let's go with. You know, in your opinion, it, it, amateur wrestling. I hate calling it amateur wrestling, but we need to make a definition right here, right? So if I know, uh, I agree with. I agree with you. I, I, I just say I just just wrestling. You know, I, wrestling, wrestling. <laughs> it's so wrestling. If we uh, we, we wrestle with an R. <laughs> if we, uh, you know, if we as the sport of, of wrestling are to take some lessons from professional wrestling, you know, wh- what is it that we could take, and what is it that you would say? that amateur wrestling needs to do to create a, a legitimate professional league that can stand on its own two, two feet and create revenue for itself? Well, I'm going to say something that's going to piss a lot of people off. That's what Jerry, I'm we love it. Tradition. I love pissing exactly. people off. <laughs> I love I'm going to say, let these guys have a friggin' personality. I Don't, love it. You know, and, 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 and damn it, bar them or suspend them, find them or, or kick them off the damn team or something. Don't let them run to the back. Get those interviews. Get that emotion. You're when 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 Tony Ramos a couple of years ago at the World Cup cut that little interview afterwards. There was more on the internet, more on Twitter, social media, everywhere about Tony Ramos at little tirade, the Olympic trials even than, than there was yep. about anything yep. else. Any great match yep. that was there that night. What what was the news that came out of there? Tony Ramos right. is pissed off at brands. You know. Yep. That was the big news, and should he say that? Well, hell yes, he should say that. You know, that's what's wrong with us. We don't let our guys express ourselves. Give a, uh, crowds are drawn by personalities. Of course. We've had some of the greatest athletes in the world with Sanderson, Smith, and guys like that, and Askrens, and, and I tell you, Ben, I told you right when I first met you, I can't remember how many years ago. We're getting 2006, old, I think. 2007, maybe. <laughs> 2006. Man, you know, you, I've never seen anybody with charisma. I just, I, I came to St. Louis that night. I think you're a freshman. Yep. And I just happened to pop in just to see some of the big guys. Matter of fact, that's where I got Jake Hager was that night. Uh, ah, Jack okay. Swagger now. Yep, Jake he, Hager, he I wrestled him. Yep. you heavyweight that <laughs> night. But anyway, I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, and, and I'm a fan. So, you know, I don't have to get to the arena until the big guys wrestle. But I'm a fan. I love wrestling. So I go and I watch everybody. 25 pounders on up because I enjoy the competition. And so all of a sudden I hear this rumble and I look out and I look at the back and here comes this guy with the damn pro, you know, bouncing up and down. And who the hell is this guy here? You, you hop on that mat and there was nothing but action for seven minutes in that crowd. I mean, you get what, what our guys talk about all the time you got the pops brother you got the yeah. pops of even you know you when you get those pops whether they're booing your ass which they did a lot of places they're chin yeah. your ass you know you're getting a reaction and that's it that's what that's what in pros that we work for and that's what draws money is getting reactions yeah and you did it and then you there probably didn't have too many empty arenas when you were in college no and, and obviously now um especially listening to chael you know, he's a big fan of professional wrestling, obviously. And, right. you, you know, this is kind of our craft because with MMA, they say, you know, they right now I fight MMA to make money. I, I make no bones about that, Jerry. And yeah. and one of the things is people need to tune in in order for me to make money. If no one's tuning in, no one's going to give me a paycheck to go fight somebody, right? And right. so exactly. it doesn't matter if they love you or they hate you. If they're tuning in, 
you're good to go, right? And so yeah, yeah you're 100 percent on this personality thing, and and so but the, the the wrestling culture, right, has said don't no personality. You got to keep the interviews yeah. blunt. So you know if we're gonna create these. These person and we have a few of them. You know, Jake Herbert's a good personality. Tony right. Ramos, yeah, absolutely. Says absolutely. what he wants. Jake's another one. But do yeah. we do we set up some kind of seminar where we teach these guys to say say some shit so they get some controversy <laughs> stewing or you know how do we get these guys? How do we change the culture? Because well, you, obviously you, I mean, in pro wrestling they make them do it. If you if you don't yeah. know how to talk on the microphone. You're not getting you're out. You don't make you're money. Out. You don't make you don't make you don't make money. You don't make money. You're one of those guys looking at the lights every night. You know, yeah. if you can't talk. And yeah. so that's not what you want. But uh, you, you're changing the culture. You got to change with these kids. And I think a lot, I think some of these high school kids get it because I, I go to a lot of high school tournaments here in Florida, and uh, and I see some personalities starting to come out, and I think it's because of UFC. I think it's because of WWE, and I don't think it's a bad thing. And and, and, and I always I, I always chuckle my my butt off when I at, at the national when I see a guy do a backflip or a cartwheel or a, after a match or run up in the stands. I love that reaction. Love it. And the crowd and the crowd loves the reaction. I mean, holy cow! You know, can't they get that? <laughs> can't so they Jerry, look Jerry, at let's their own product. Are they too close to the product to look let's at? Take it? Step, like let's take a step. Like Let's take a step back here because you know we're talking about what we can do better. This, that, and the other thing. You have a wrestling background, and you've been a part of a promotion outside of amateur wrestling as we know it. You know, just a plain question: Do you think it can be done? Do you think wrestling can be? A a profit generating revenue stream that sustains itself and and yields significant dollars for everybody involved and significant visibility. Do you think it can be done? Not in its present uh, uh, state of, of life, no. But uh, like everything else, like every sport in college, it's evolved. In in basketball, I mean, years ago. I, you guys weren't even around, but you know the dunk was outlawed one year when uh, Al Sender, uh, Kareem uh, Jabbar was uh, dunk, doing all those dunk at U, U, yep. UCLA. They barred the dunk for like two years, and the people wow. got bored. Hey, man. That's so profound. They it back. That is so profound. And then there were no three point shots, and then they say, hey, "Man, we need to score." So you know, basketball started scoring. Now you see these kids when they score a big three pointer, they celebrate. I mean. Damn basketball players get to celebrate. Football players get to celebrate. But we've had pounded in our heads since we were six years old. Guys, you, you're modest. You get that win, and you take it like a man, and you lose like a man. If you win, you go in the back, and you celebrate, and, and you let your emotions out there. Yeah, you know one thing. The crowd, and, the crowd needs to see that celebration. The crowd I, needs to feel that emotion. I agree. And you know one thing I noticed in MMA, I picked this up. No, no one told me this. I picked this one up. But I started noticing in all these promos – what did they show in every single promo of a of an MMA card? They show the person what? celebrating his previous win, whether he knocked yeah. the guy out and he flexes, whether he jumps on the cage. So I, you know, in a bunch of my fights, yeah. I I thought of like, hey, I need to do some stupid shit after yeah. I win this fight, and they're you know flex, slap myself in the face, run around yeah. and scream because that's what they're gonna put. And listen, they put it yeah. on the promo for the next fight because people love, like you're you're saying. Listen, you're you're speaking the truth here. People yeah. love that emotion because if it doesn't matter to you, why should it matter to them? Exactly. If you can't get emotionally invested in, in a talent on the map, then 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 the public public uh, when they're watching TV, like like you you, you watch TV, I watched uh, MMA. We were all sitting there cheering and, and booing and everything because you you get involved, you get emotionally involved in it. But if you if if if, if the talent, if the guy on the mat doesn't give you that excitement and give you that body language, you know, and, and at the end of a show, you know, like, hey, man, I just won a national championship. I'm happy, you know, yeah, <laughs> instead yeah. of taking off running a 3 4 4 4 40 back to the back, you know, <laughs> so he can celebrate back there and by himself. That sucks. So We're Jerry, the only sport in the world that does that. We're the only sport in college that does that. Let's, Jerry, that let's, that let's hides, that hides our champions. <laughs> let's wave, let's wave the mat. Magic wand, Jerry. You're you're running wrestling. You've got a 15 year runway. 
and and the board of directors has told you we need to professionalize the sport we need to be a, a revenue generating profit center for ourselves what are you doing in your first two years on the job i'm kissing ass with reporters and tv people i'm building me a media background i'm building me a media base i'm building me a database that i can go to these guys hey we got a big duel coming up between uh between uh, uh, Rutgers and Cornell at the, at the big football stadium, we need to put 45,000 people in there. You know, I would want these people at my back. I'm going to take, if, if, if the NCAA tells me I can't use the talent, I'm going to take these coaches. I'm going to take somebody like Sanderson. And you know what? I'm going to ask him a question. I'm going to have my reporters keep asking questions until I get him pissed off, until I get emotion out of him. And you're going to get That's emotional. great. <laughs> and is it, is it hard to get a reaction out of brands? I mean, sometimes I, I watch the Big Ten Network, uh, you know, because they have such great coverage yeah. of wrestling. And, and I get off where I'm watching brands. I would wish sometimes they would just put a camera on, on brands. I'd blow wrestling when they did that. Did their special on brands. It was just phenomenal. But put a put a camera on him. And, you know, that insert of a, a, uh, that. Uh, in, in the picture in, in, in the uh, main screen, you know, do an insert of brand facials while, while one of his guys are on the mat. You're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get, you're going to get outside. If you're just clicking through and all of a sudden you see this insane coach, I mean, you know, college basketball coaches, they feature them. So why not feature a uh, brands or, or a, a Sanderson or, or a Smith or somebody like that? You know, both Smith, Missouri Smith and Oklahoma State Smith. Yeah. Um, and so, so obviously, we've talked. We've talked about personalities. We've talked about controversy, uh, and, and those are two of the certain elements you need to build uh, a se- you know a successful money making organization. Um, and another one, you know, I think you need is uh, is you need to have a purpose for the organization. And I, I think this is. I've talked circles around this w- with with Mr. Chael because he loves professional wrestling, and I believe I discussed it with you too, Jerry. But you know, how do you create a champion for a new league when, you know, they have the world championships every year. And you said, you know, in professional wrestling back, they, they would just call some guy the toughest guy in the room and he was the freaking champion right. until someone else proved him wrong. And then over the course of many years, the belt comes to mean something, right? And so, right. Uh, you know, do you agree with that sentiment that, you know, if there is a league, there has to be a championship or a belt or something that means something that people can get invested in um, and you know, obviously, right away it might it might it might not mean something, but over time it, it'll mean more and more and more. Well, you're exactly right. You, that's like building a, a talent. We call him Babyface, a good guy, in, in our business. You know, just say uh, John Cena. It took us years the to ultimate build John. Good guy, and then, right? Yeah, and yes, he, he's the ultimate Babyface. I mean, there's. there's he does more make a wish grants than any athlete in the entire world and any, any, any human in the entire world. So he, he's a great guy. But anyway, it, in, in the beginning, people didn't like him. Said he's uncoordinated, said he couldn't talk, said he was, you know, phony and all this stuff. But we kept, we kept on the same path. We kept driving John Cena, kept driving John Cena and kept showing the stuff that he does good. And John, of course, his work. His, uh, his in-ring uh, ability picked up a lot, too, because he's a heck of an athlete. And he just started getting better and better. But we, we stuck the program. With 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 college wrestling, what, 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 what needs to be done is, is you know, you take your, your pre-mail uh, programs and, and you start, you know, somewhere with ESPN or start somewhere with a local channel. But you got to – guys, TV – if you're building an amateur league, TV is is your main thing, and you can't you can't you can't build a a, a program without a good TV coverage. And so uh, I'll, I don't know if you if you think local, then there's always TV stations to get on locally, but uh, there comes a cost of production. So who's going to pay for the production? What, what well, there's, there's a lot of variables. Obviously, the WWE has a WWE network. Um, do you see the online streaming for sports as, as the future? Because uh, you know, they're, WWE is investing in that, obviously. Um, and you know, ESPN is losing viewership. Obviously, TV is important, but do you think the online streaming is, is the possible future of sports programming? 
Well, it is for us, and and we're 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 looking now. I mean, we're 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 our network has grown so much in the last couple of years. I think now we're like number five network in the in the world. You know, be uh, behind Netflix and you know the major ones like that. That's amazing. We're we're all up over a million and a half of subscribers worldwide, and we haven't even got into China yet. China China is our next market. Once 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 we get into China. Well, one one providence in China, we look to probably match the uh, our, our our subscription level with one providence. Wow! In China. Oh my god! And that's that's just right around the corner, you know. And, yeah. uh, and when that market opens up, it's just, it's going to be tremendous for us. You know, we're 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 huge everywhere, but that that that's you know a hidden market. That in India and then uh, of course South South America. Yeah. So let's we talked about pro wrestling. Let's let's talk some fun stuff. Who you got coming on the pipeline for uh, that, that we would know? That's a real wrestler that's going to make it big in the WWE. Who's who's the next well, big thing? <laughs> it's funny, uh, you know that uh, Chaz Betts, who was on the Greco yep. team a few years He's, ago, uh, now what's his name? Chaz, Chaz Gable. Chad Gable. Chad yep. Gable. <laughs> Chad Gable. Love it. I follow about him on Gable. Twitter. Yeah, and so. Uh, He's doing fantastic. And did you see that deal that Dan did for him? He did that ready, willing, and gable towel bit for uh, for Chaz too, which was fantastic. And uh, his uh, Chaz's part, tag team partner, uh, Jason Jordan, is Nathan Everhart that wrestled in Indiana. Indiana. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I could never remember that guy's name. I looked at his picture and I'm like, I know this guy wrestled yeah. for Indiana, but I cannot remember his name. Yeah, yeah, uh, Nathan Everhart. He, he he's going to be a big star. Those two right there, just off the top of my head, and what uh, current on NXT. Those two right right now are blowing everybody in the world away. It's just not a uh, a USA thing with them. It's a, they were just over in, in the UK and just blew out blew out the UK over. Really. Huh. So why can't yeah, so there's there, there's some good guys. I got I got out of, out of seventy seventy talents down there. They, I think we uh, amateur wrestling, college wrestling, got probably uh, fifteen guys down there, nice. and then more on the way. More on Jerry, the way. did you did you were did, were you behind recruiting uh, Nick Nemeth, who is now Dolph Ziggler? I sure was, and then my old buddy Tadaki Hata is the one that brought Nick to me. Tadaki wow. we were in Cleveland one night, and Tadaki called me, and he said, hey, hey, I got a guy, a kid up here that wants to be in pro wrestling. Uh, I want you to meet him. He said, come on down. You know, so That's crazy. I'm an, Ohio, that I'm an Ohio boy, and we're the same age, so yeah. it's crazy to see where he's yeah. at. Yeah, well, he, he, he what, a, what a good guy he is, too, and he, he's well-deserving, and he's making a bundle right now. But, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a good kid, but Hot is the one that turned me on to him. And uh, wow, uh, hey. Lesnar, uh, Lesnar, I got uh, brought to uh, Jay. Uh, uh, Jay and I were in the same recruiting class, so uh, so I, I yeah, Jerry, Brock. let me cut you off here. I didn't give you the proper introduction. I should. I'm, my wife yells <laughs> at me all this all the time because I don't introduce people well enough. And so, for our listeners who who are maybe not as informed, they're not as in the know, Jerry. Uh, he wrestled at Oklahoma State in the '60s, and obviously, as we're talking about, made his way into professional wrestling. But was you know teammates with Tadaki Hata and all these other huge names that were at Oklahoma State in that era. Yeah, I was in there with with a bunch of studs uh, from Father to uh, USA's first world freestyle champion. You know, to Bill Harlow, who just got inducted into the Hall of Fame. They were the ones that kept my name off that uh, that starting board. <laughs> and that I was a good. Uh, 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 practice room wrestler, but uh, I never really was any good, you know, in public. <laughs> wow. Until I got, got into the entertainment. So, um, Brock, obviously, as you just mentioned, is not, he, so they just announced he's coming back to fight UFC 200. Uh, he hasn't fought in approximately five years. Obviously, and let me ask you. Let me let's change the roles here. What do you? Let's think? go. I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear your your opinion. I, you know, yeah. I, you and I talked about punk and all that. Punk's yeah. got to be sitting there. What the hell is going on? You know. Here, so, what is Jerry about, asking? What you think, Brent? About, what do you think? Yeah, about, I'm asking Ben. Yeah. What do you think about it? Well, you know, I think that you know, with with every situation, Jerry, there's a lot of angles to look at it from. Like, I, you know, I can't look Brock in the eyes and say, "What do you want to get out of this?" Maybe he just. Maybe he want, he's mad he got his ass kicked in his last fight and wants another shot. You know, maybe he wants to hang it up to Victor, right? Or maybe maybe he wants to make, he's going to make a bunch of millions of dollars. Maybe that's what he wants. Maybe 
Um, there's some crossover because obviously he said he's going back to SummerSlam, which is in August. So it's not yeah. like he's going to have a career with the UFC. Um, you know, as far as UFC is concerned, Brock's going to make them a, a lot of damn money. They they needed kind of an exclamation both, point. Both, both organizations a lot of money. Also. Yeah. So they need an exclamation yep. point for UFC 200. So, um, you know, I know a lot of other fighters feel kind of kind of cheated by the push Brock's getting, but Brock, well, they Brock is Brock. <laughs> they should. But he's Brock. He's going to make millions of dollars. And Brock, you got to accept that. Brock. I mean, Brock is a freak. You can't, you can't, you know, that, that, our guys should get pissed off that Brock comes in and gets <laughs> all the big money. Well, it's the same thing that you see, you know, but. You know that that organization, as ours, is driven by big guys. Yeah. And once once they lost Lesnar, I mean, they, you know, all of all those heavyweights are, are big guys, but none of them had that beast mode like Lesnar has. That look, you know, yeah. that I'll kill your ass. You're not, you know, he's a guy you're legitimately afraid to look in the eyes. You know, most people are. You know, afraid to well, Jerry, it's kind of like what we we talked about it last week, and kind of. Reminds me of what we were discussing, Ben, but, you know, your market value is nothing more or less than what people are willing to pay. And those guys get mad, but it's like, you know, people are going to pay to watch them. So yeah. that means he gets paid. That's just how that works. Exactly. They, 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 you know, they buy those pay-per-views, and that, that's all that counts, you know, and, and that pro bet, that's the reason they call it professional. You know, it's <laughs> right, not amateur. Right. <laughs> you get paid for it, so... But Brock, Brock is just one of those unique characters. Uh, he's one of those guys that's come around, you know, once or twice in a lifetime that, you know, it, it's just a, it's a holy crap every time. I never will forget his first appearance at, at WWE TV. What happened? People, their dolls. He, he walked out, he ran out, he ran out, he ran, did a run in and I destroyed some guy. But all I had him, all we had him do was go out and do a double leg takedown into a body slam. Just, <laughs> Stick with what you know. Keep it basic. And after that, do a farmer's carry and slam the damn guy. He did those two moves, and I never heard a, a response like he got in all my life. At first, it was just this rumble. Then when he saw him, it was just total silence. Then when he did those two moves, it just, holy shit. They call that a you pop. Know, yeah, I got, that, I got that pop that everybody <laughs> wanted, you know? And uh, we all looked at each other, man. He's the one, you know? Damn. You, you just saw ching ching. That's all you heard. You heard ching 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 ching. That's uh, it, yeah, man. We we saw we saw it coming, <laughs> man. And uh, but you couldn't hold him down. I mean, there's this monster you got. And but anyway, you know, Brock Brock was a great story. And uh, but to me, he he's a great lesson, guys. You know what what some of these guys could do. You know, come to WWE, learn how to uh, be a star, learn how learn how to sell those pay per views, and if you got that talent, you know you can bypass all the preliminary stuff and go right straight to the main event of UFC. It looks like you know, yeah. and then come back and main event uh, SummerSlam for WWE. Yeah, so that, that's for you know, sure. But to me, if I was a big guy in college, I'd look at Lesnar and I'd see that path that he's taken and he's successful in both of them so yep. that means you can be successful in like if, you're, it. if you're dedicated and then, <laughs> then going back to what you said why why he's coming back i think it was a, the, the first uh scenario that you said i think he left uh ufc with such a bitter taste you know getting beat yeah getting embarrassed and i think uh i think he's gonna go out and i don't I'm, you know i don't i don't know much about the guy he's fighting i just know he's a good striker and you know but one of those guys that you know you hit him right and he goes down but uh, yeah. i don't i don't know if he'll get to the point where brock will let him hit him you know i think brock will be in on those legs so quick you know there won't be any striking going on yeah i, I mean I, I think that that fight goes one of two ways and it goes one of those two ways very 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 quickly either brock takes him down and beats the tar out of him or you know or he gets his takedown stuff and, and mark hunt probably knocks him out you know i think so like you're saying i think it goes one of two ways Really, 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 really quickly. Um, so let's transition to another big guy, Jerry. Why can't you get Nick Wazdowski signed up? Well, there's a little <laughs> thing called 2020. I, uh, that's what he wants. Me, uh, <laughs> that's what he wants. That's it. And, 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 you know, and I hope he gets it. And he's a young man. He'll only yeah. be in his late 20s at 2020. You know, and uh, so. I, I tell you, Nick and I, I've chased him for three years, man. I've got to know him well. 
<laughs> no, his dad, his brothers, yep. <laughs> everybody. Cause... And he he loves WWE. I mean, he he's a big fan. Yeah, he came to WrestleMania. And... Came to WrestleMania and had a ball. And you know, Ric Flair and all the guys met him, and they were all just you know, this is guy can be, can be Brock Lesnar. You know, this <laughs> guy can be the animal. There was a lot of buzz. Yeah, I told Nick, Nick, you created more buzz just being here, and you would have you know, anything you could have done. And uh, guys enjoyed meeting him because you, you know, Nick, he's a first class young man, and uh, I wish him nothing nothing but the best. But uh, he and I talked uh, all the time. I we were going to go to the tournaments, and so I sit there and talk with him. But the 2020 is his gold, and, and you know, yeah. I, you never discourage a guy from that. You know, go go for what you want. You know, Gotta and come and see. I'll be there. I'm gonna be there. I'll be waiting. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's great. So, okay. End of the story. If, if Tommy and I get this professionally up and running, which you know, it's we're just we're just bullshitting about it now, but. You know, down the road, who knows? It is, it is really, yeah. legitimately one of my dreams to start this. You know, in America to have a, and I, I've been a part of two field ventures, so we we can count on you to come <laughs> yeah, in. And, that, that's it. Tommy, and you go jump in. He's been a part of two field ventures. You know, Vince McMahon declared bankruptcy hey, twice before he hit uh, hit on uh, hit on WWE. You got to fail. How a much few money? Times. How much, money, Jerry? If, if you think it's possible, you said it, you said it's possible, but not in the current state. So. If we could change the current state, if we could alter the way that the sport is presented, how much money do you think it would take? And we're, we're spitballing here, as you know. How much money would it take before um, the organization became cash flow positive and was done bleeding money? Okay, well, you you, you know, we, we've been talking about all these promoters, and most of them going broke, right? Well, I'll leave you with a little quote that, uh, that uh, Terry Funk uh, it says, Terry, what would you do if you won the lottery? Well, I think I'd go in the wrestling business until I went broke like all these other lottery winners, you know. So <laughs> I think it would take endless pockets is what right. I think. And, uh, right. And it would be, and I can't tell you, and, and, and endless pockets and, and a real friendly TV provider. Yeah. Gotcha. So, all right, man. Well, Jerry, that, that was fun. We got a history of wrestling. Uh, we got to talk a little WWE. We got to talk a little bit of MMA. Is there uh, anything else you want to leave us with? Any more knowledge? Any more uh, predictions? Hey, what do you got? No, Ben, I just want you to knock out everybody to get in that damn ring with a member of fighting's like a dance guard at the homecoming. Queen. You only got so many spaces, so take advantage of all of them. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yes, That's sir. great. Well, thank you, Jerry, for coming on. Thank we you, appreciate Jerry. It. That it was, was a lot time. of fun. All right, guys. Have a great night. I really enjoyed it, and I hope it's good, man. Talk to you later. Thanks, Jerry. See ya. So, t ben. Tommy, how did you not get signed up with Jerry? Twenty. You. What would your What would your WWE character have been? You know, I, I'm a vanilla guy, and I was particularly <laughs> uh, out of college. But I re I remember people whispering to me that the WWE was asking, and I kind of had probably with Jerry. I kind of had the quiz. I didn't spend any time with him. I didn't get pursued in a way that's memorable. But I remember people saying, they're asking about, you know, you, you should think about that. And it was so, you know, it was like, I, I kind of probably, same reaction quiz has, you know. And it was just yeah. like, what, yeah, why would I do that? But yeah, now I know, Mark 35 Ellis. and I got four kids, it's like, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, let's have a conversation. But the ship has sailed. So Yeah, My, I'm Mark Ellis. I was trying to pitch him, and I was going to be his hype man because Jerry didn't say it, but the what Jerry told me, right? And so this is before WWE's playing. This is before any of the smaller wrestlers really made it. What Jerry told me was, he goes, "Son, if and he's got that Oklahoma accent, like you heard, he said, son, if you were two hundred twenty-five pounds, I'd make you a million dollars a year, no problem." And I said, "Jerry, I ain't never going to be two twenty-five, so I guess I'll catch you around." <laughs> <laughs> but he That's tried funny. to. Pursue a teammate of mine, Mark Ellis, who won a, a national title heavyweight, and I was trying to pitch Mark that he could be uh, the the cowboy preacher. Uh huh. That and that would have been his personality, and uh, I could never sell Mark on it. I thought Mark would have been a great pro wrestler, but he would never pursue it. I think he did go down and do the tryout at the, they called the power plant for a week, but uh, but that well, was it's it. difficult for people Ben to step outside of themselves. You don't struggle with that, but. <laughs> Other people do, so it, it sounds ridiculous to them at the time. But when you really think about it, it's like, man, that's that's a hell of an opportunity. 
hell of an opportunity. So, yeah, I mean, I think we learned. You know, I think the main thing I always take away from those guys. That's are, a smart guy. He's seen a lot of stuff. A lot. Of I always, stuff. I always like tapping into other people's wisdom. And when you said that on Facebook today about the kid that was asking you about what it took to transition from high school yeah. to college, and you said, "I can tell he's already going to be good because he's just because he's asking." Yeah. And um, I I like hearing from people like that because it's like, how could you not uh, let their wisdom influence you? Yeah, because I mean, well, right when you cut to it, if if what I tell me, I legitimately one of my dreams in life is to have an American, real legitimate professional wrestling league that runs that athletes make money and that the organization makes money. It's gonna I, happen. It's gonna in our happen. Lifetime. In our it's lifetime. gonna happen. I want, but and so um, you know, Jerry's a guy that it, it's not the exact same field, but it's damn close. He's done it right. I mean. And, and WWE wasn't what it was 40 years ago or 50 years ago when he started with them. It if I, if, a lot. I mean, Ben, I mean, I would, I would want to do it for a living now if I didn't think it took such deep pockets before it got going. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like, I mean, you got to go deep to, 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 to get the traction you need before it becomes profitable, in my opinion. It's going to happen, though. Yeah. I think Flow Wrestling will be at the crossroads of it, too. Definitely. You know, I've been getting a lot of e e emails, messages. I even got a guy that called me and left me a minute and 45 <laughs> voicemail about how he, he loved our show. He's got all these ideas about professional wrestling. I wasn't really sure how he got with my, my phone number, but he was excited. I gave it to him. <laughs> he I'm was passionate kidding. about it. So, you know what? I think this is a topic that hopefully we can revisit over and over and over it's again. It's a good off-season topic, too, because really we can is. just drill down, you know? So, so what do we got moving forward? I'll tell you, my camp season starts this Thursday, so I'm going to be busy. But what what do we got moving forward um, from this? Next week, we got well, I mean, been, in, wrestling wrestling topics. What do we got? Wrestling topics. You know, we could go. We could do an episode on camps. Okay. Um, what, what makes a good camp? We've got um, Fargo coming up. Fargo. So we got. We were five. I gave my guys this talk yesterday. I said, guys. We are five weeks and two days from the start of cadet freestyle and five weeks and three days from the start of junior freestyle. It's going to go fast. But yes. for us, that's five episodes till we get Right. There, so. We got one episode we got, on we, Fargo. We got one episode on the Olympics. Uh, probably two. That's a ways away. You know, that's yeah. The I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking we got 10 weeks, you know, in the summer. Maybe we well, ask our listener base, who, who else do, do you want us to get on the show? Um, we've had some great guests, Rich Bender, Isaiah Martinez, and, you know, recently – we could always get Rich back on here and grill him some more. That was a lot of fun, and everyone seemed to enjoy that. He wanted to come back on. I feel like we cut him off, too, so maybe we should revisit that. That was a long episode, but next week, I don't think we have any wrestling events going on that we need to cover. So, you know, if Rich wants to come back on, I guess we'd have to you know, find a few topics. I would really like to get to the bottom of, are they really going to do this new weight thing? Because that, that would be freaking fantastic if it is. You know another guy who I would like to talk to? Uh, Jay Kerber. I think he'd be a fun guest. It would be fun. And it could, would be I a could lot of fun. I on him about how he used to whip his ass all the time. I'm in on that. I'm in <laughs> on that for sure. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, brother. Good episode. Good guest. I got to give you a lot of props for that. I didn't know how it would go. I, to me, that was one of my favorites because I, I felt like I was learning instead of, you know, promoting, if that yeah. makes any sense. I mean, I no. felt like I was a spectator. So yeah. I enjoyed that. He, yeah, he has, he has a wealth of knowledge. So, yeah, and if we if, if any of our listeners, if just tweet us. Who, who do you want us to bring on? We, we will bring on um, anyone that has anything related to do with wrestling and, and, you know, have a good time with them. All right, brother. We're out. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Defense Soap, for all of your support. Have a good night. See you. You are listening to the T. Rowan Funky Show, and it is brought to you by Defense Soap. Defend what you've built. Tommy, I got to say, I, I tried these products. He shipped me a box. Uh, I love them. I've, I've had, uh, if you know me, you know I had, I've had ringworm issues for a long time. Um, so I, you know, I'm looking forward to putting these in my repertoire and, and hoping uh, the ringworm does not come back ever. No doubt, Ben. And to top that off, the company was created by wrestlers. Guy Seiko wrestled at Cleveland State University. His son was an All-American in Virginia, so these people really get it. They know what the wrestling community needs.